Okay, welcome to our Tuesday night study. This is June 18th, 2024. And um, we are right now in book of Luke. And we've been trying to apply right division to God's Word. And uh, we slowed way down when we got to the Gospels because of churchianity doesn't rightly divide so they don't understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we want to make sure we understand these correctly. Um, the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels. There's a lot of similarities there. So now that we're in Luke, I'm trying to cover things that you don't see uh, so much in Matthew or Mark uh, that are specific to Luke. At least they may be same stories, but there may be a couple different phrases there that are important to understand. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So there may be just a couple things added in Luke that you don't see in Matthew and Mark, and God wants you to diligently seek Him to find those things. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Last time we were in Luke chapter 11. At the very end we covered the Lord's Prayer in the first four verses. And we saw how that differs from what churchianity says and we learn to understand the Lord's Prayer uh, in its you know what it means because it was for Israel with the at hand phase of the kingdom there so today we'll continue um, we need to remember uh, where we are that this is the at hand phase kingdom at hand phase and today I'm hoping to at least get through chapter 13 and if we do then we'll cover this that they are required to give a hundred percent giving and then when they do then they are God in return or Jesus in return is going to give them the kingdom leadership in the kingdom so um, it's it's something different for Israel they are because of their unbelief they were placed under a fleshly covenant and so there are fleshly manifestations of the Spirit of God within them that is important as opposed to us today. They had to, um, back in the, under the Levitical law, they were supposed to tithe a required amount that they would give, and not money, but of their possessions, of their increase of their crops or their flock or whatever it was. And they give it to support the Levitical priest who had a, a full-time job learning all the laws of the Mosaic law and how to keep them. They had physical blessings, they had physical cursings. That's why you see healings in Jesus' day, because the physical was meant to show a sign of the spiritual. But uh, Jesus Christ, through the Apostle Paul, today says in Colossians chapter 2, Colossians 2 and verse 16 and 17, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So we have the Mosaic Law is a shadow of things to come, and the body is of Christ. The body of Christ, and what we are to do is found in Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. So right now that we're in Luke, we're looking at the shadow. So we're going to see there is not, now when you get to the at-hand phase of the kingdom, the stakes are raised. It's about time for the Antichrist to come on the scene, tribulation period, then Jesus' second coming. And so they weren't just required a 10% giving program, it was a 100% giving program. Give all that they had, and then they would get treasures in the kingdom. They would get um, a hundredfold, Jesus promises them in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 29 Matthew 19 29 says they would get a hundredfold back so you know that's a real good return people will give up their money uh, stock market to try to get what 10% return annually 
if somebody has a plan to get, say, 20%, I mean, they'll give all that they have just to get a 20% return, thinking, you know, that's, that's a good deal, but they're going to get 100-fold. So what is that? 100-fold 100 100-fold 100 is 100, and that's 10,000%. That's a 10,000% return. And that's from Matthew 19, verse uh, 29. So, and they're going to get eternal life on top of that. And the thing about this is this is going to last them forever. You know, if I get 20% return on my money, I mean, that's phenomenal. How are you going to get that? That's rare to get that. But if you get that, okay, so I get that, but then inflation eats it away, and... Um, even if I keep growing the money and have great money, well, and I die, I don't have the money anymore. I can't take it with me. But for them, they're going to give all that they have 100% giving right now. And then when they get into the kingdom, they're going to get back 100 full, which would be a 10,000% return. Uh, yeah, 10,000%. And, so, and that will last for, forever. And they have eternal life. It won't cor be corrupted. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he says to, uh, I think it's chapter 6, um, yes, uh, Matthew 6 verse 20, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now you say, oh, I thought they were going to have eternal life on the earth. They're not going to have it in heaven. And that's correct, but Revelation 21 tells you that New Jerusalem comes down from heaven. Jesus said in John 14 that he went to prepare a place for them, and then he would receive them unto himself. So he's in heaven preparing a place for them in the New Jerusalem, which is in heaven right now, and they lay up for themselves treasures in the New Jerusalem. That's why it says treasures in heaven. And then when the kingdom of heaven comes down on the earth with Jesus Christ's rule, then they have those treasures on the earth in the kingdom. Um, so now with that in mind, let's go back to Luke 11 and just point out some things uh, here. Uh, Luke 11, we covered the Lord's Prayer, the first four verses. Uh, verse 20, I wanted to mention here is that the Pharisees are claiming that Jesus is casting out devils by the power of Satan. It says in Luke 11, verse 15, some of them said, Luke 11, 15, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And basically, of course, he's not doing that. Um, he is doing it by the power of God. And he tells you, I just wanted you to see this phrase that only Luke gives you, because the story is also in Matthew chapter 12. But I wanted you to see here in Luke 11 and verse 20 a specific phrase. It says, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, with the finger of God he cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. What did I use to cast out devils? I didn't use satanic power. I use the finger of God to cast out devils. And why is that important? Well, the, the term finger of God is used four times in Scripture. This one here, Luke eleven twenty. The others are Old Testament references. Uh, Exodus 8, verse 9. Exodus 31, verse 18. And Deuteronomy 9, and verse 10. So Exodus 8, verse 9, Exodus 31, verse 18, and Deuteronomy 9, and verse 10. So let's look at those. Now the Exodus 8 one is a reference to the God contest that's going on between God and the gods of the Pharaoh. And, uh, you know, God sends the different plagues. There are different miracles. Well, there are these uh, plagues that uh, the Lord sends through Moses. The... The magicians of Pharaoh can duplicate the first couple. But then, uh, when you get to the plague of lice, uh, in Exodus 8, verse 16, um, verse 18 says, Exodus 8, 18, the magicians tried to do the same thing, to bring forth lice, but they could not. 
And then verse 19, Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. So the finger of God is a term. I put Exodus 8 and 9, didn't I? And it's really Exodus 8 and 19. Okay, so correct that in your notes. Exodus 8 verse 19 is the correct one. And I need to put it on my sheet here. Exodus 8 19. So uh, it's showing that the finger of God is a representative of basically the highest power, you know, that, um, that's there. This is a power beyond satanic power. And then in Exodus 31, 18 now, Exodus 31, 18, the term is used again. And hopefully I got the reference right this time. He gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. The finger of God there. And then um, Deuteronomy 9 and verse 10. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 10. Deuteronomy 9 verse 10. The Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. So these two references are the Ten Commandments. And then these two references, the Luke 11 and Exodus uh, 8, 19, refer to uh, God's ultimate power, greater power than anybody else. But I wanted you to see that what he's doing is, so when he says, I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, what he's doing is he's exalting what God is doing at that time, which was the Mosaic law given. So Jesus does that, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. He'll give the Mosaic law and he, um, you know, and he shows this is the true meaning of the Mosaic law. Unlike what the Pharisees do and try to obey it in a fleshly way, it's really a heart issue that you need to obey it. And, and so, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, what's interesting about that when you think of today is that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 7, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 7, these Ten Commandments are called the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. But we've got today, it's also in verse 9 called the ministration of condemnation. So there's a ministration of death and condemnation. But we have today, uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and uh, verse 8, we have the ministration of the Spirit, which, of course, this is the ministration of the Spirit too. Uh, this finger of God can represent the Holy Spirit giving that commandment, but it's really administering death to people because they can't obey the law. But today's ministration of the Spirit is one in verse 9 there, 2 Corinthians 3, 9. It's called the ministration of righteousness. So today, it's uh, so 2 Corinthians 3, 9 today, it's the ministration ministry of righteousness. That's what we have today. And so you see how revered the finger of God he uses. Jesus uses the finger of God, which is the Ten Commandments, to do the miracles that he does, cast out devils. In other words, the law. Even though the law is the ministration of death and condemnation, God's power is so great, his ultimate power is so great, that Jesus can use something that is death and condemnation to overcome Satan's kingdom, casting out devils. How much more then, now that we today have the Spirit and it's the ministry of righteousness, how much more can the satanic power of the course of this world and the things of the devil be cast out of our lives when we trust in God's Word? That's why we must make the Bible our final authority. It is, it's something that God has established the whole world. Heaven and earth was built upon the foundation of the mighty Word of God. And it's something that we need to get in our inner man and allow Christ to live in us. Because if, the, if Jesus can use a ministration of death and condemnation to cast out devils, then we can use 
Paul's epistles, the sound doctrine for today, the ministry of righteousness, to not just cast out Satan's program, but to have Christ live in us and share God's love with others. That's how powerful this is. God can, the, the Ten Commandments is administration of death and condemnation, but it has such great power that it can overcome the satanic world. But we've got something far greater, the ministration of the Spirit, the ministration of righteousness, and, and we can, uh, with that, have God's love and bring God great glory as a result of that. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, or, or verse 18, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, the finger of God, the Spirit of the Lord, giving you not just ministration of death and condemnation, <coughs> but the ministration of righteousness. And it changes us from His glory, God's uh, our, our fallen glory to God's glory coming through us. So all the great glory from that and uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So it shows you how much greater that is. But I wanted you to see the finger of God which shows you that Jesus was using God's ultimate power but he had to use it in a limited way because of the unbelief of Israel, that he was doing these physical miracles. The true power of God is seen in the spiritual, as we see for today, the ministry of righteousness. But, and uh, certainly those who would believe the gospel of the kingdom and be water baptized could be part of that. But as a whole, Jesus wasn't able to do that, minister righteousness. He really had to minister death and condemnation and give a glimpse of, of what people could have, the ministry of righteousness in them, if they would believe the gospel. But because of Israel's unbelief as a whole, this didn't happen. Except, you know, it happened through the 12 apostles and others. But for the most part, for the nation as a whole, the ministry of righteousness did not happen, which is why Israel's program had to be set aside at the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Okay, moving on from there, um, there's a, something that's mentioned in... Luke verses 27 and 28 that you don't see. I don't think it's in the other Gospels. Luke 11 verse 27, And it came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lift up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So it's uh, what this shows here, because you think about it, uh, here you've got the Son of God, the Messiah. He's doing all these miracles. He's trying to bring in the kingdom of God by getting the lost sheep of the house of Israel saved. He's going to die on a cross for their sins. I mean, Jesus does, you know, you look in John, at the end of the book of John, in John 21 and verse 25, John 21 verse 25 says, There are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And scholars say, oh, that's hyperbole. He's just exaggerating. I mean, the, you could really write them all down and the books would contain it. But God can't lie, and God's ways and thoughts are higher than ours, so i got to take it literally if that's what it says. And so, yes, you, in other words, what Jesus did on earth, dying for our sins, in hell, on the cross, rising from the dead, having that resurrection life, eternal life in him that he can impart to us. And then all the other things he did before that, preparing Israel to be saved, did the miracles and different things. Everything he did in his life together, it's basically unwritable is what it's saying. There is just so much, if you were able to somehow put all the details down, uh, there wouldn't be enough paper and pen to write it all down. There's a great verse, the love of God, the hymn, the third verse. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe? By trade to write the love of God above which uh, drained the ocean dry. Nor would the scroll contain the whole, they'll stretch from sky to sky. Ah. Wonderful truth about the love of God. 
And uh, that, I believe, came from this verse. John 21, 25. Uh, Jesus, things he did, or maybe not, I shouldn't write things. Uh, all that Jesus did, all that Jesus did, uh, unwritable. You, you just can't write it all down. You couldn't, you know, you can write what we got here, but there's just so many things. It's just, it's so great. Just the love of God is so great that you can't write it all down. And Jesus was the epitome of the Father's love. Uh, you can't write it all down. It's all unwritable. That's Jesus. And what does this woman say when she sees Jesus? Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. <laughs> You're worshiping Mary. What are you doing worshiping Mary? I mean, certainly Mary was a, a woman who uh, trusted in God, who is no doubt in the kingdom of God, and, you know, she was blessed to give birth to Jesus, yes. Uh, the angel says that in Luke 1. But uh, you got the Son of God in front of you. Everything he did was, it's unwritable. You can't write down all the things that he did. God's love coming through him, spiritually and physically. Everything is so great. You, there's not enough ink. There's not enough paper to write down everything that Jesus did. He's standing right in front of you. And instead of saying that and worshiping him, you say, Blessed is the womb that bare thee on the paps which thou hast sucked. What this shows is, and I think it's, in the nature, the sin nature of women more so than men, although men would do it as well. Um, woman's nature to worship Mary. There are uh, Eastern religions, and uh, I've even heard years ago that you know they, they, there are people today too, especially who try to get the divine feminine into things, and they'll call God a woman. And the idea is it goes along with woman's nature because woman's desire is to usurp the authority of her husband. And so the ultimate way of doing that is to worship um, a woman, basically make God a woman. And that's where woman's nature to worship Mary and that's where you get the, the queen of heaven idea and what's going to happen with Mystery Babylon, Revelation 17 in the tribulation period. So I just wanted to point that out that that's mentioned there um, you know, the, the worship of Mary. But you notice what he says, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. That goes back to, it's the ministry of righteousness. If I hear the word of God and keep it, now for them, of course, it was death and condemnation, but when they believed the gospel, then they could transfer into the ministry of righteousness. And so, uh, you see what God, what Jesus focuses on. You know, he doesn't, Focus on himself. Jesus, uh, because pride is the sin of man. Even Jesus, I mean, if anybody could brag on himself, you'd think it'd be Jesus. But he didn't do that. He was always pointing back to the Father. He said in John 6, 63, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. It's my words that have spirit and life. So don't go worshiping Mary. Forget about her. Keep the words that I have given you. And the reason that all that Jesus did was unwritable, it was so great, the great display of God's love that you can't write it all down, is because, um, because he kept the word of God. He says, everything that the Father has told me to say and do, that's what I do. So he points himself, he doesn't point himself to what he does. You know, look at me, I'm going to die on a cross. Look at me, I'm going to overcome hell. Look at these miracles I'm doing. He, he points back to the Word of God, which is, again, why we need to learn that the mighty Word of God is what this world is built on, heaven and earth. And we need to make that our foundation. Don't look to man. If anybody, if you're going to look to any man, you look to Jesus, right, as a man, because he lived perfectly. He did no sin. He always did what the Father wanted him to do. And he doesn't say to this woman here, worship me, which there wouldn't have been anything wrong with saying that. But he says, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. He tries to take the focus off of man or woman, Mary, and put the focus on God's word. 
And that's what we should do today. No matter how good I am at explaining God's Word, no matter how much you learn from it, um, it's not going to be perfect because I have a sin nature. But even if it was perfect, as it was with Jesus, He never made a doctrinal mistake. He always taught it correctly. Even with Jesus, He says, don't worship me. He says, hear the Word of God and keep the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Psalm 138 verse 2 says, God has magnified His Word above all His name. The most precious thing we have in this world is the Word of God. Because it's the Word of God that gives life. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And so we want God's life coming through us. And that's, that's but you see man's tendency. The woman's tendency, worship Mary, Queen of Heaven. Man's tendency, exalt a man. You know, the pastor. Oh, the pastor is a man of God. I heard that from the church I grew up in. You can't question him. He, that, man is a, 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 that man is a man of God. What he says is true. You can't question him. And unfortunately, that's what we see in Right Division, is they will believe something because somebody with authority says it. They exalted man above the Word of God. It's just like anything else. Every other denomination out there, the man in the pulpit is the one in charge or the denominational statement of faith or the doctrine of that church is above the Word of God and that's how it is in right division as well but I wanted you to see this that the woman is trying to worship Barry and he could have said Jesus could have said worship me and I don't think there'd have been anything wrong with that but he wants her to get her focus off of worshiping a person and getting her focus on where the life and the love of God comes from, which is the Word of God. So he says, Blessed are they that hear the Word of God and keep it. Now we'll go down to verses 37 through 41. And this is going to, uh, again, this is a portion where if you don't rightly divide the Word of Truth, um, churchianity, they have no clue what this is talking about here. Um, but this is going to get us prepared for what we're about to see in Luke 12, which is this 100% giving program to receive the kingdom. And you see this with a certain Pharisee in Luke 11.37. Luke 11.37, as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, in other words, this was a lesson. Um, you know, I'm sure I would guess, I don't know, but I would guess it's a custom to uh, wash before dinner, and it's probably a good idea. I mean, I'll do that. A lot of times I'll go to the gym after work, and then I'll come home and eat. Well, I come home and I wash my hands before I eat. That's a good idea. But it's not something that's uh, going to make you any more spiritual. It's a good idea so that you don't get sick, but uh, spiritually it doesn't change anything. And the Pharisees had made it a point, and Mark 7 tells you that, that you must wash your hands before you eat. They made that a commandment of God in their tradition. They upheld that over the Ten Commandments. That was of greater value to them than the Ten Commandments were. And Jesus knew that, and so he probably intentionally just didn't wash his hands before dinner so that he could give the lesson in verse 39. Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. In other words, the Pharisees have taken the commandments of God and thrown them away, and they've replaced them with their traditions, which have to do with cleansing the flesh and not the spiritual. And so he doesn't wash his hands before dinner to make that point. Now verse 40, ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? but rather give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. Whoa. So give alms of all you have to be clean inwardly, is what he just said. Churchianity seems like would run with that one. <laughs> because... He's basically saying, give all that you have, and then you'll be clean inwardly. And maybe that's what uh, the Catholics did with their selling of indulgences 500 years ago. I don't know. I don't know how they came up with that. 
Uh, but he's saying, take all that you have and give it to the church, and then uh, you'll have forgiveness of sins, basically, clean inwardly. Well, what is that? I thought you had to be repent and be baptized. Why do you have to give all that you have? Well, because uh, a couple of reasons for this, and we're going to see this also in Luke 12. So uh, the first reason to understand is that they are under, so reason number one, they are under a fleshly covenant, which is the Mosaic law. We are not under that today. We are under a spiritual covenant. And so um, they were to obey the things of the, the flesh. They had cleansing ceremonies, they had animal sacrifices, they had feast days, they had those things. So um, a physical giving of money then would be in line with that fleshly covenant. That's why they're commanded to give tithes. Malachi 3 says in verse 8 that you rob God by not giving your tithes. You know, today you can give money to me to help me put out a website or to pay for you know the video editing software on this or, uh, or just because you're getting blessed by it you want me to continue. Uh, you can give me money. You don't have to give me money. That's, that's up to you. Uh, you're not sinning by not sending me any money, and that, that's fine. Um, and that's why I don't emphasize that. You know, that's up to you. That's between you and God. But for Israel, if they did not give their ten percent of their increase of their, you know, their their um, crops or their uh, flock or whatever it was, Malachi three eight says they are robbing God. It is a sin for them not to give the ten percent. Um, so they're under that fleshly covenant of the Mosaic Law. Not tithing equals sin. And Malachi 3, 8 through 10 will tell you that. Uh, again, I wanted to emphasize that that's not for today. So don't think you have to send me 10%. You can if you want. You can send me nothing. You could send something in the middle. You could send more than that. That's up to you. Whatever you want to do is fine. But for them... They were required to give the 10% or else it was a sin. They disobeyed the Mosaic law. So that's the first part. Um, the second part is Jesus says you cannot serve, and I didn't write down the verse, but he says you cannot serve God and mammon, M-A-M-O-N. And mammon, mammon, it's hard to say, mammon, 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 uh, is the God of money. And you see 1 Timothy 6.10 goes along with that. The love of money is the root of all evil. And for them, this is particularly important because what's going to take place halfway through the tribulation period is they cannot, if they don't take the, they have to take the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell. So, Think of somebody like, say, Warren Buffett, let's say. Let's say he's in the tribulation period, and if he don't take the mark, he can't buy or sell. Well, you know he's going to take the mark. Uh, automatically, guarantee he's going to take the mark. Because he's got so much money. You know, say he's got $100 billion. I can't even fathom how much money that is. <laughs> um, he's going to lose $100 billion if he doesn't take the mark. So, of course, he's going to take the mark, and that's a... It would be some digital chip probably in the forehead or in the right hand. And uh, that's your digital currency. And, uh, and so they'll transfer the $100 billion into this digital currency. And now he can, he can continue on with his life. So, of course, he's going to take the mark. But how about somebody who's over here at the rescue mission in Mobile, Alabama? Uh, they, uh, you know, they've been an alcoholic. They don't have any money. They're homeless. That's why they're at the rescue mission. And they say, if you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. Oh, you mean I'm going to lose all my bank account? All my money? Uh, let's see, how much money do I have? Zero. So I'm going to lose all of that? Um, okay, that's fine. I don't care. You know, what, are you, what are you going to take away from me? I have nothing. You can't take away my money because I don't have any money for you to take. You know, somebody comes up to him. With, no one's going to go into the rescue mission to the guy hold the gun to his face and say, give me all your money. He doesn't have any. Essentially, the mark of the beast is that. They're saying, holding the gun to your face and give me all your money. If you don't, well, I'm, you know, I'm, well, you don't have a choice. You, you, I'm going to take the money from you if you don't take the mark. 
And so what's happening is the mark of the beast is coming up. Uh, don't take it. Then they can't buy or sell. We'll just, we'll just say, uh, don't take it. Then they lose all their money. They lose all their money. So if I have $100 billion, I'm going to take the mark. And Revelation 14, 9 through 11 says, take the mark, end up in hell. The mark is the eternal security program for Satan. You can take the mark, and then later on you say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. The Antichrist is of the devil. I change my mind. I repent. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be water baptized. I'm going to believe the gospel of the kingdom. Too late. The book of Hebrews gives warnings about that. And it talks about Esau. And it says that Esau, he despised his birthright. Once he gave it up, he couldn't get it back, although he tried. It says there in uh, Hebrews 12 and verse 16. Hebrews 12, 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Hebrews 12, 16 and 17. Hebrews 12, 16 and 17. Esau, example of those who take the mark. Why did he give up his birthright? For a morsel of meat. Why do people take the mark? So they can get on the government welfare program. They can get money. They can get, not money. Uh, so they can get food, clothing, shelter. And so it's the same thing. And then Esau realizes, what have I done? I lost my birthright. I could have had the firstborn's blessing and I gave it away. And so he sought it back carefully with tears. And I'm sure he was genuinely sorry and wished he could get it back. But it says he found no place of repentance. He changed his mind, but there was no place where God would say, oh, okay, or um, his father Esau, uh, Isaac, his father Isaac would say, oh, okay, here's the birthright. I'll give it to you instead of Jacob. No. Once he gave it to Jacob, that's it. And so it's the same thing with the mark. You know, it's, it's something where it's, it's a bigger deal than today if you say, to somebody, recognize your sin, trust in Jesus' death, burial and resurrection as atonement for your sin, and they decide, no thank you, thanks anyway. Um, you can try again next week. Maybe they say, no thank you, and then a year later, you try again, no thank you, and then a year after that, somebody, a loved one dies, and then you give them the gospel, and they'll say, yeah, I think I'll believe that. And now they have eternal life. So they rejected it three or four times, but then they believe the gospel, finally, they get eternal life. But when it comes to this mark, they say, if you don't take the mark, you lose all your money, and uh, you can't get food. And so the person says, well, you know, I got a, a good bank account. I don't have $100 billion, but I got, say, $50,000. Uh, you know, I can make a nice down payment on a home. Um, I'd like to do that. I'd like to buy a home, have my own asset there to live in. Uh, so, yes, I'll go ahead and take the mark so I can keep my 50000 or I keep my home. Um, you know, just like, let's say, you own a home. Well, you got to pay property tax. How are you going to pay property tax if you don't have the mark? You can't. So, even if you've got, say, hard assets, what are you going to do? People say, oh, get gold. You know, that, that's a hard asset. So, inflation, it's a curb against inflation. Well, yeah, that may be true, but how does it work when it comes to digital currency? Okay, yeah, you got gold. Okay, we'll give you uh, 500 for your gold. We'll give you 500 credits in the digital currency. So you got to take the mark in your hand or in your forehead to get the credits so that you can buy something uh, with that. But So you got to take the mark. And so then you take it and you realize, oh, wait a minute. I thought the Antichrist was God in the flesh, but really he's of the devil. I changed my mind. I go back to God. Too late. You can't get it. Esau couldn't. You can't either. And so what he's doing in Luke 11 is he's saying, that's why it turns from when the kingdom is at hand, the at hand phase, it's not 10% giving. 
it is 100% giving. Because if I give all that I have and I rely upon God to, to take care of me, well then, um, when the time comes for the mark, number one, if you do this, so why, why the 100% giving? Well, number one is uh, give all. That helps reach lost sheep of Israel. Reach the lost sheep of Israel. It says in Matthew 10 that Jesus commanded them in Matthew 10 and verse 6 to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and they're to go from city to city and it says that in verse 23 you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So believers based upon Matthew 10, 6 and 23 um, believers travel the entire tribulation period. They are to go from city to city to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. And that takes money. You know, let's say uh, I want to go on vacation. Well, I'm just going to go on vacation for a week, let's say. Well, I got to pay for hotel and uh, food on there. I got to get there somehow, whether I fly or I rent a car or I just drive my own car. Uh, I got to pay for gas. I got to pay for maintenance. You know, there's expenses involved with taking a vacation. And um, so I do that for a week. I go on vacation. But then I got to come back. I can't, I, you know, I, what would I rather do? Be on vacation and travel the world or work at my job sitting in front of a computer all day? Well, I'd rather travel and see the world. But I can do that only in limited spots, you know, because it takes money. And I got to go back to work to get the money to pay for these vacations. Uh, now, for the believing remnant, they go into people's houses, so maybe they don't have the hotel bill, but they don't know who's going to take them in. And also, they're on a permanent, wouldn't call it vacation, they're on a permanent work for the Lord. They're going to travel the entire tribulation period. That's seven years. But there's a gap between the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel. We don't know how long that's going to be. It's at least a year in Acts 1 through 7, 2 through 7. How many more years will it be? I think it's going to be 120. Could be 40. Uh, but it's got to be at least 20, I would think, based upon the year markers in Daniel 11. Either way, they're going to spend many, many years without a job, a source of income. So you go ahead and sell all that you have right now. So, because you're going to be traveling until Jesus comes back. Between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus, the believing remnant is supposed to travel the entire time, not vacation, but go from city to city in Israel, giving the gospel of the kingdom so that the lost sheep of the house of Israel may be saved. Uh, and so, it's going to take money to do that, and they're not working a job. And halfway through the tribulation period, the mark is going to be instituted anyway. So even if you saved and you had all this money, halfway through the tribulation period, your money is worthless because you don't take the mark. And so this right here, give uh, all, it helps reach lost sheep of the house of Israel. But more importantly, it uh, keeps salvation because there's many people who will believe the gospel of the kingdom, be water baptized, but then they'll do what the warnings in Hebrews tell them not to do, which is they will take the mark because they value the things of this world more than the things of God. And so, um, if you say, let's say you have $50,000, and, uh, and then the mark of the beast is implemented. Well, that's a tough decision to make on what you're going to do. But if you've already sold all that you have, laid at the apostles' feet, and now it's been pulled together to pay for these traveling expenses, and, um, and by then you would think all the money is gone, well, then, when you make the decision on if I'm going to take the mark or not, it's a really easy decision. You'll say, well, no, I'm not. Because I've already trusted in God, and you've already had supernatural intervention. In uh, Matthew chapter um, 6, uh, he says, uh, verse 25, Matthew 6, 25. Oh, here's the serve God and mammon passage. 
Matthew 6, 24. Matthew 6, 24. Well, in Matthew 6, 25, he says, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? When Elijah, he prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. What's three and a half years? The time of the tribulation period in which they don't take the mark, they can't buy or sell. So there's a three and a half year period in which there was famine in the land of Israel under Elijah, and Elijah was fed by ravens. God brought food in the mouth of birds to help Elijah to eat. Believe in Israel, in the last half of the tribulation period, exact same number of time, three and a half years, and they don't take the mark. God's going to supernaturally feed them. Perhaps birds come with food. I would think that would happen because then that would remind them of, oh, God did this before with Elijah, and Elijah was sustained, so now God will sustain us. And he does this because the miracles of the food is what will get the rest of the lost sheep of the house of Israel saved. There's a widow woman and with her son. They only have one meal left, enough oil for one meal, and they're going to eat it, and then that, that'll be it, and they'll die from starvation. But yet God saves them by making that oil continue to, to come, and they continue to have food. That right there probably resulted in the woman and her son being believers and being saved, whereas before they probably would not have done that. You know, just reading into the text, but that's probably why. And so some of the lost sheep of the house of Israel are going to be reached by that. You think of what happened in 2020, and I can't say exact words on here, but you'll know what I'm referring to, is that um, there were people who are not believers, but and may have lost their job if they didn't do a certain thing, and they decided, you know, they're not, they're not going to heaven, they haven't believed the gospel, but they decided... Well, I'm not sure I can trust the government to give me that certain thing and what it's going to do to my body. So I decide I'm not going to do it, and even though I lose my job, I'm not going to do it. Uh, there are a lot of people who did that. And so they're not saved. Well, you think of the mark. A lot of people who haven't believed the gospel of the kingdom, but they say, I don't know about having a digital chip implanted in my forehead or in my right hand. Doesn't that mean they can implement some kind of mind control, control me? I understand the digital currency prevents identity theft, and I can understand that aspect to it, but I don't really want the government to put a chip in my head. <laughs> so, you know, again, they're not believers. They're not going to be in the kingdom because they haven't believed, but at the same time, just like some of the people chose not to do a certain thing and they lost their job, there's going to be people in that tribulation period to decide, you know what, I'm not going to take that mark because I don't trust the government with that chip in my forehead. And what happens? They all, oh, here comes a believer preaching the gospel of the kingdom and they say, oh, well, you want me to make, give you some food? Because you didn't take the mark and you're starving? Well, I only got enough for one more meal and then we're going to just starve to death, but okay. And then you give them the food and, oh, guess what? There's more food. Next day, there's more food. The next day, there's more food. What's this gospel of the kingdom you're talking about? Hmm, there must be some truth to that because I'm getting supernaturally fed here. So I'm going to believe that gospel. So these miracles that take place through the little flock, not eating, not taking the mark, helps get the rest of the lost sheep of the house of Israel saved who didn't believe initially, but also wouldn't go along with the mark or the image of the beast. Uh, by the way, that three and a half year passage, um, James 3, I, I'll throw that out there because in Elijah, if you read 1 Kings and read Elijah, it doesn't tell you the three and a half years. It's James 5, I think. Um, yeah, uh, James 5, verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again in the heaven, gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So, James 5, 17. Uh, so, uh, over here. <laughs> 
James 5, 17, that's Elijah and famine for three and a half years. Three and a half years famine in the days of Elijah. And that would go along with the three and a half years of the mark of the beast. There. Where you don't have... Um, now, they didn't take away their money there, but money's no good if there's no food. You say, I give you a million dollars for a loaf of bread. Sorry, can't help you. Don't have a loaf of bread. Uh, so it's very similar to the Mark situation. There for three and a half years, you can't find any food. Uh, three and a half years, you don't take the Mark. You lose your money. You can't buy food. So then you're trusting in God to save you. So then Israel going from city to city. I put that up here somewhere. Yes, Matthew 10. They travel from city to city and... They're hungry because they didn't take the mark and they ask for food and they get food from people who also didn't take the mark and they're down to their last loaf of bread. And yet somehow more food just mysteriously appears because of the member of the believing remnant being there and God supernaturally feed them as a sign of the gospel of the kingdom being true. So that's what Luke 11.41 is all about. And we took a long time to explain that, but it was important because it's going to tie into this next thing. Rather give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. That doesn't mean that if you give 100% uh, to God, now you bought eternal life. That's not what it means. What it means is, you know, you can't serve God or a man, God of money. If you're willing to give up everything you have, for God, then that means you've repented. You've changed your mind. You're not trusting in your own righteousness. You're not trusting in what the Pharisees tell you. You're trusting in what God has said, uh, the gospel of the kingdom. You've, you'll be water baptized, and then you'll follow what God tells you to do, which is to sell all that you have for these reasons. So then when the mark comes along, then you won't take it because you don't have anything anyway. So it's not a temptation to you. And that's a one-time thing. Just like I mentioned with the gospel. I can give the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins, and you can reject it a hundred times. But on the hundred and first time you believe it, you're saved. But with this, you take the mark once you're lost and you're bound forever in a lake of fire. And there's no getting around that. And so this is a very... You know, but rejecting the gospel today is also a, a very important thing that you should not do because maybe you die before you get a second chance. Uh, but at least with the mark, it is just once you take the mark, that's it. You can seek repentance with tears and you won't find it. You've sealed your doom in a lake of fire. So it is out of love that Jesus tells the Pharisee. If it's a certain Pharisee that besought him to dine with him, well, this Pharisee is part of the religious system probably has money if he can afford to bring Jesus in to dine with him. And it's going to be the religious leaders that sign a seven-year covenant with the Antichrist beginning the tribulation period. It's the religious leaders who are going to uh, implement the mark of the beast. It's actually the false prophet who does that. And so it's going to be somebody, I think it's the Catholic, the Pope, but it'll be at least somebody who the Jews will... Uh, be willing to follow whatever he says. And so uh, the Pharisee, being a Jewish religious leader, then would uh, be one of the first to take the mark. And so Jesus isn't saying, you give everything to God, he'll give you eternal life. But what he's saying is, forget about the outward, but concentrate on the inward. And if you concentrate on the inward, you will repent. You'll give up the Pharisee's traditions. You'll seek to follow the commandments of God. You'll trust in God to save you. You'll get water baptized. And then you'll sell all that you have. And then you will be clean. Because then, when the mark of the beast comes and you would lose your salvation, if you take it, you won't take it. You won't commit the unpardonable sin of taking the mark or worshiping the image of the beast. Because you've changed your mind and then you put your money where your mouth is. You put the money and you gave it away to fund the uh, reaching the lost sheep of the house of Israel as believers travel that entire period giving the gospel of the kingdom to all the cities of Israel or all that they can reach uh, before that time. So what it's really doing is there's a fleshly covenant and so they're required to give under that 
but God ups the ante at the at hand phase of the kingdom from 10% to 100% in order to receive the kingdom. Not that they buy their way in, because it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not like the indulgences where there's a set amount. If you have nothing, you give nothing. If you have a million dollars, you give a million dollars. The way, the idea is to bankrupt you financially because if you don't take the mark, you're going to be bankrupt. And so if you're not willing to do it now when things are good, then you certainly won't do it when things are bad later on. You don't uh, bow down to the image of the beast. You are to be killed. So if you won't accept Jesus' death, burial, you know, people will say, you know, well, I've got loved ones and they won't believe Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin. How are they saved afterward? Can you make a video and show how they're saved? And I've done that and, that, and that's fine. Um, and, you know, there will be people saved that way, but I can tell you it's a lot easier to get saved now and be part of the rapture than it is to wait after the rapture and go through all the trials of the tribulation period, run for your life because you don't bow down to the image of the beast, don't have food or uh, possessions because you won't take the mark. Uh, right now, I can still buy food, clothing, and shelter and have a bank account. I can do that um, and still be a believer. I don't lose my salvation. I can participate in the economic system and it doesn't affect my uh, salvation. That's not the case in the last half of the tribulation period. So believe the gospel now. Don't wait till the tribulation period. It's going to be a lot harder to do it. And so Jesus is basically making increasing the odds of those who believe the gospel of the kingdom to not take the mark and not bow down to the image if they sell all that they have now and give it to the church. So then when the mark comes, it's like, oh, you don't take the mark, you won't participate in the economic system. And you pull out your pockets and you can't see it now, but this pocket is empty. Um, <laughs> there's nothing in it. You're going to take all of this? What if I got a piece of lint in here? Have it. Have the piece of lint. You know, uh, but if I pulled out a, a million dollars out of that pocket, I better take the mark. So what Jesus is doing is, if you'll make the decision now to give up what you have, then when it comes to the mark, you won't have any problem. Say, I'm not taking that thing. You lose all your money. I don't have any money. Take it. Take nothing. Take 100% of nothing. I don't care. You know. Uh, so that's what Jesus is doing with this giving program. And again, it's also for them to travel during the entire tribulation period. So since we're there, let's go ahead and jump uh, forward. To Luke 12 and we'll come back but since we're on the same topic here uh, Luke 12 and verse uh, 31 uh, going back to what we read in, Mar in Matthew 6 that's also given here in Luke 12 uh, you know verse uh, 27 consider the lilies how they grow they totally spin not uh, but they're arrayed gloriously verse 28 God clothes the grass uh, how much more will he clothe you verse 29 uh, don't take any thought for what you eat or drink uh, but rather, he says in verse 31, Luke 12, 31, Rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, it doesn't mean in this world they're going to get rich. That's what people think the health and wealth gospel, prosperity gospel is. Oh, you give money to the church. You plant a seed. You sow a seed, and God will give you the hundredfold or the tenfold or whatever it is. Well... That is a true statement, but the, and even today it's a true statement, but the tenfold or the hundredfold is spiritually for us in heaven, not today. If I give a hundred dollars to the church, I'm not getting a thousand back. Um, I lose my hundred dollars is what happens. But if I'm giving it because I want to give, like you say, oh, I know... The website you're about to develop, it, or you're paying to get developed now, it costs money, so I want to give $100 to that. Um, you're not going to get a $1,000 check in the mail. You're not even going to get your $100 back. You lose that $100. But it's going to help with getting the website up and the monthly fee for that. And so then um, the result is that if you gave it, it's all about motivation. God loves a cheerful giver. So if you gave that $100 out of 
uh, wanting to advance God's kingdom here so that people may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth and you think well the website would help and so I'm going to do that and you give that hundred dollars well then what ends up happening is in heaven um, now you'll be rewarded for it because God says you gave of your physical for the spiritual you valued the spiritual over the material and so then God uh, will give you an, a reward in heaven for that but on the earth no no, you give you give the money to the church, and I made my example, but um, you, but a lot of people do. They'll give it to C A Dollar or T D Jakes or Joe Osteen or whoever it is, and the mega church down the road. You give it to them, you're not going to get a big check in the mail. Uh, and if you do it to get rewarded with a big check in the mail, and you're a saved person, well, then when that that work is brought up at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. Because, yeah, you gave the money. Yeah, you gave it to the Lord. And it was for a good cause. But it the motivation was, oh, I'm going to get something better in return. So that's why I'm doing it. So if it's a selfish motivation uh, and it's not to advance uh, being ambassadors for Christ, getting people saved, coming into the knowledge of the truth, if you're given because the guy said to plant a seed of $100 and you'll get 1000 in return, so you did it because it's a get-rich-quick scheme, then not only do you lose your money here, you also didn't get rewarded in heaven. So that's a bad deal. Uh, but that's what people do because they're focused on the flesh. So to get money to come into the church, they got a promise that something would happen materially for you in this world. Uh, and people focus on the flesh and that helps them get a lot more money. I'll see this at these gospel concerts. There's a certain promoter who will just go on and on. He'll talk for 15 minutes to try to get money in the offering so he'll have he'll have the concerts live online so whenever he does that I usually go take a shower or I do something 15 minutes later I come back and oh he's still talking <laughs> he gives this great pitch and for me that turns me off I say well I was going to give some money but now that you keep begging for it I'm not going to give anything but apparently most people it doesn't work that way most people start feeling guilty and uh, they give more money because the more he talks about it the more money they give and or else he wouldn't keep doing that. So, um, and that's how the world works. The vast majority of giving is based on a fleshly motivation. It's what am I going to get return in this world? Because I'm only trusting in this world. And so, and then if it's, uh, and the, the guilt thing is what they offer. Because it's not like, you know, buying a car. You give me 20000 I give you this brand new car. They can't do that with giving to a church. Give me a hundred dollars, I'll give you. What are you going to give me? A book that you wrote that cost you five dollars to print? Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it's not really a good return. I could go buy the book for ten dollars somewhere. Um, Dr. David Jeremiah was giving this uh, seminar when I was in Myrtle Beach uh, on vacation, and I, I didn't stay for that, but he had all these books out there, full retail price. They're like twenty-five, thirty dollars for these books. I went to the thrift store the other day and. I could have got the same book for 50 cents there you know <laughs> so well I'll go give money to him I could get it I could get it here I get the same thing a lot cheaper you know that's what we do we try to find the best bargain so when it comes to church you know, and they say give money I'm thinking well what am I gonna get for it you know so then they have to invent this thing oh plant a seed and God will bless you and he'll give you all this stuff um, and so, you know, then, then they uh, do that out of that return or they talk for 15 minutes and try to guilt you into it. Well, you know, this group here it costs $5 a gallon for diesel and they're getting four miles to the gallon. So it's costing all this money and they came all this way and they did it for uh, because they love you and share God's love. And, uh, you know, and they, they're young people. So they, they you can see they're skinny. They need, you know, they just keep going on and on and try to guilt you into it. Okay, fine, I'll give you $20. Will you shut up now? You know, and so uh, those are the tactics that are used, but it's all of the flesh. But what Jesus is doing here, he's not trying to do that. He says, uh, give what you have here, give alms, and then all things will be clean unto you because there's coming a time where if you don't, if you take, if you don't take the mark, you're going to lose all your money. And if you do take the mark, because you value the things of this world more than the things of God, you lose your salvation. Today, I'll just lose my reward, but I still have life in heaven. But here, it's 
you lose your salvation and it's a one-time deal. Later on, you change your mind too late. You're still sealed in the lake of fire. So God wants to avoid that decision and say, do it now when there's not so much at stake. And then when it comes to the mark, then you won't take it. And so he tells them in Luke 12, 31, Rather seek ye the kingdom of God, all these things shall be added unto you in the kingdom, not right now. No plant a seed and you'll get ten times back, not right now, but in the kingdom. It's a spiritual reward. And maybe it is a physical reward, a hundredfold, but it's in the kingdom. It's not right now. They're going to be running for their lives and starving to death. God's going to provide for them, but it's not like he's going to just have a filet mignon appear. What did he do for Israel in the wilderness? He gave them manna. And they said, I'm sick of this manna. All I eat is manna, 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 manna. I'm sick of this manna. Well, it's enough to sustain them. It's enough food and they get by. But it doesn't satisfy their lust. I mean, what do you do when you, when you go, want to go eat after work? Uh, usually you don't say, well, the cheapest meal is the top ramen. I'm going to buy a, fifth, a case of top ramen and for 30 cents I'm going to eat. That would sustain you. I don't know how long. A lot of salt in that. Probably wouldn't be good for Anyway, uh, but you end up paying more for something that tastes better, that satisfies you better. And so God is going to provide them food and will sustain them. And if there's too much salt in it, I mean, God will take care of that stuff anyway for them. But it's not going to be something they like. It's not a filet mignon or T-bone steak or whatever you like the best, you know, a gallon of chocolate ice cream. It's not going to be that, but it's just going to be enough to sustain them. And if they're focusing on the spiritual, then they'll, they'll get by. But in the kingdom, that's when they're going to get all the good stuff. It says in Isaiah 61, verse 6, that they will eat the riches of the Gentiles. So maybe we'll put that up there as well, Isaiah 61, verse 6. So that's when they get the riches. Not here, but in the kingdom. And so he tells them, uh, Luke 12, 32 now, Luke 12, 32, and uh, what in the world should I erase? Let's try this here, since we're talking about the giving stuff. Uh, and then we'll go from there. So Luke 12, 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12, 32. Let's also read Matthew 21, Matthew 21, 43. Matthew 21, 43. Matthew 21, 43, we learn it says, uh, Therefore say I unto you, this is Jesus talking to the religious leaders, Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So from Matthew 21, 43, we learn that a kingdom taken from Pharisees, given to a nation, bringing forth the kingdom uh, bringing forth the fruit thereof. What is that nation? Given to a nation, a nation, that is what Galatians 6.16 calls the Israel of God. Galatians 6.16, the Israel of God is that nation. You know, today there's a nation out there called Israel. That's not God's Israel. Man made that up. Man gave it made it in 1948 and, or something like that and man is going to bring the Antichrist in and they're going to say this is the fulfillment of prophecy and the Messiah because we've got the Messiah in Israel but it's a fake Messiah in a fake Israel the true Israel is the one that believes God the Israel of God and that Israel of God is defined for you in Luke 12 32 of the nation being the little flock the believing remnant of believers. So that's why, you know, I say, well, Matthew 21, you can understand the kingdom taken from the Pharisees and given to a nation, but you don't know what that nation is unless you read Luke 12. So you've got parallel accounts in Matthew and Luke. They're very similar. Probably the of the four Gospels, Matthew and Luke are the two that are similar to each other more than others. Mark has a lot of events 
I just go, 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 go. Matthew and Luke, you've got some of the miracles, you've got some teaching, and they're very similar in nature. Matthew and Luke, more than any other books. But yet, I needed to read Luke, read Luke 12 to find out that that nation is the Israel of God. It's the little flock. And then he says, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That's the nation. And then verse 33, sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there you, will your heart be also. And we mentioned the treasure in heavens is in the new Jerusalem that's going to come down on the earth. So it's not saying they have eternal life and re, an eternal reward in heavenly places like us today. It's saying that their treasure is going to be in heaven because on the earth, Satan and his forces would take it away. The Antichrist would take it away. So the treasure is in heaven. It's a spiritual treasure that will be kept safe by God up there and will be brought down to the earth for the kingdom. So they are told then in Luke 12, 33, to 100% uh, giving program. And that's where we get the title for this message, 100% giving to receive the kingdom. And hopefully you've seen it's not buying an indulgence. The idea is to prepare their minds so that they will not take the mark. If you give 100% now, you don't mind giving 100% later because you don't have anything then. But if you've got a whole bunch of money when the mark comes along and now you have to give it up, you're probably not going to give it up. So that's why sell now and you don't have to make that decision later. So that's what the 100% giving program is all about. And you know, you bring this up. People who don't rightly divide, they say, you got to follow the red letters. This is the first thing I bring up. Well, Luke 12, 33 says, sell that you have and give alms. A 100% giving program. Have you done that? Well, no, that doesn't mean that. It means if you feel led to do so, then you need to do that. First off, it doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Uh, if you feel like it, sell all that ye have and give alms. It doesn't say that. It's a commandment. Sell that ye have. What do I have? Sell it all. Sell that ye have and give alms. Oh, that's not what it means. Well, that's what it says. How do you know that's not what it means? It's because you don't like it, so you change it. But how I know that's what it means is I go to Acts 2 and Acts 4. Because then Jesus Christ is in uh, heaven preparing a place for them. Uh, the little flock, the 12 apostles, are now in charge of the church there. They are the new shepherds that God has set up there in Acts chapter 2. And they implement, Jesus said in Luke 12, 33, sell that ye have and give alms. And that's exactly what they implement. Acts 2, verse, 40, verse 41. Acts 2, 41, there are 3,000 souls added to the church. So you had 120. Now you've got 3,120. Verse 44, Acts 2, 44. And all that believed, not those who felt led by the Lord to do so. No, all that believed. How many is that? 3,120. All that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men who agreed to participate in the communist system and those who kept their money stayed separate. No, it doesn't say that. It says they had all things common, sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. So Acts 2, 40, Acts 2, 44 and 45. All believers sold all they had. How do I know that Luke 12, 33 is telling every believer to give 100%? Sell everything that you have and give it to the apostles here? Because that's what I see happening in Acts 2, 44 and 45. Then we go over to Acts 4 and we see it again. Verse 34, Acts 4 and verse 34. Acts 4, 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. 
So again, you see, 34 through 35, all that had possessions, all that had possessions sold, all they had. This is not voluntary. 100% giving is required. Required. How do I know? I see it in Acts 2 and Acts 4. And then in Acts 5, there's a husband and wife called Ananias and Sapphira. And they understand that this is required, but they say, you know what? I got a lot of money from this land that I sold. They don't need all that money. I give them half. I give them half. I'll keep back half. I mean, I'm giving a lot, you know, because other people here, they didn't have anything hardly. I'm giving more than most of the people here because I had a very valuable piece of land. So I'm only going to give half. Certainly that's enough. I keep back the other half, right? Because it's up to me to give what I want to give. But no. It says in Acts 5 verse 2 that they kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy of it and brought a certain part, and laid at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost, and keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst well, it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not in thine power? Oh, okay, so they could have kept back. Well, if they kept it back, they'd have been kicked out of the little flock. So yeah, I mean, he could have sold the lamb, and decided to keep the money himself. But if he did, well, now they're kicked out of the little flock. So then they go on there. They're like everybody else out there. They're just trusting in the things of this world rather than in the things of God, and they lose, he'd lose his salvation. This is required, so they had to do it. I mean, Jesus said it in Luke 11, and verse 41. Give alms of things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. So if they don't give at all, then it's not clean to them. They lose their salvation. Sell that ye have and give alms. Luke 12, 33. So Ananias could have said, I'll just keep the money, thank you, and left the little flock and lose his salvation. That's what it said there. But instead, he has conceived this thing in thine heart and lied unto God, not unto men. Verse 5, Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. Then Sapphira comes in, not knowing what happened, and the same thing happens to her. Uh, verse 9, uh, she, Peter says, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Yes, I would have great fear too. Uh, if I sold land and I gave it, I would want to make sure I'd qualify. I'd say, well, you know, I gave all that I had. Now, this isn't the whole thing because I had to pay for title. I had to pay the, the commission fee. I, you know, I'd make sure I'd say, hey, you know, it was, I sold it for $100,000, but I'm only giving you $91,000 because the other $9,000 went to all these fees. You know, I want to make sure you know that you're getting it all because I don't want to be struck dead and lose my salvation. You know, so I'd say, yeah, it was a hundred thousand sale, but it's only ninety-one thousand, and here's why. Here's where the other nine thousand went. I couldn't help it. I had to give the commission. I had to pay the title. I had to pay property tax or prorated property tax. You know, you give all that stuff that you got to do. That's what I would do. I'd say, hey, hey, you know, don't mess with me, man. I want to be in the kingdom. But what you see there in Acts five one through ten is an example of losing salvation for not giving 100%. So if you've got somebody who is a believer, but they don't rightly divide, and they think you, follow, you need to follow the red letters, this right here, down, is what I give them. Luke 12, Matthew 21, and... Uh, and explain 100% giving, that's not, well, if you feel led by the Lord. No, you have to. And here's Acts 2, and here's Acts 4, and here's Acts 5. Give them that information. And that shows clearly that Jesus is not talking to us today. Because even if I did this, I mean, there are people who give to the church today. Um, they don't give 100%. And they don't get struck dead when they don't give 100%. Uh, so it's showing you, that's why I say it's required. It's a commandment. 
and it has to do with them being under the Mosaic law. Uh, and so this is seen most clearly in the book of Luke more than anything else because Luke shows Jesus as the perfect man. And so a perfect man, this is what you would do. So it mentions that. Um, okay, so we've got maybe 10 minutes left. Um, let's continue here because I do at least want to get through chapter 12 since I skipped ahead. So now let's go back to 11 and verse 52. So let's look at Luke 11, verse 52. Um, and I wanted you to see this because so much of churchianity today is based on uh, legalism. It is that you've got to do these works to maintain your salvation, or if they say you're eternally secure, you're not really, because if you don't do what we tell you to do, or you don't avoid the really bad stuff, then you never had what they call true saving faith. So either way, all the denominations out there put you under some form of legalism. And so I wanted you to see Luke 11, 52 through 54. Last time we ended, not last time, the time before, two times ago we ended about the word lawyers is found only in your Bible and the book of Luke. And it's five times. Luke 7, verse 30, Luke 11, 45, Luke 11, 46, Luke 11, 52, and Luke 14, verse 3. Luke 7, verse 30, Luke 11, 45, Luke 11, 46, Luke 11, 52, Luke 14, verse 3. You notice three of the five are right here where we are. So I wanted to bring this up. Luke eleven fifty two. Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently, and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. So notice what verse 52 says. Woe unto you lawyers. Who are those? Those are the legalists. Legalism, according to that verse, takes away the key of knowledge. What is the key of knowledge? It is grace. Romans 6.14 says, you're not under the law, not under law, but you are under grace. And in Romans 5 and verse 2, we learn in Romans 5 and verse 2, uh, by whom, by Jesus Christ, we have access by faith, the faith of Christ, into this grace wherein we stand. And this grace we stand in, in verse 5, results in the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So, uh, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the way it works, uh, Romans 5, 1 through 5, is number 1, justified by the faith of Christ. Justified by the faith of Christ. Romans 10, 17, faith increased by knowledge, which is of the Word of God. I'm going to say knowledge of Bible. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And it is by that faith that we have access into grace. So, uh, God's Word in us, we uh, live in grace, rather than in legalism. Legalism is what man would have you to do. Now, God did provide the law. It was your schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ that you might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, you're no longer under a schoolmaster. You're under a new program. You're under the grace program. And the reason is because God's word in us results in living in grace. And so then, Romans 5, 2 through 5, grace results in love. So you could follow this as you get faith, of Christ when you're saved, then you get knowledge of God's Word. Well, I should say you're in grace. So the faith of Christ leads you to in grace, uh, not legalism. Grace, not legalism. And then it results in, as you read in God's Word, believe it, you let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, so it results in knowledge. And then that knowledge applied in grace results in God's love coming through you. 
and that is how. This is the ambassadorship program. This is how you are an ambassador for Christ. The moment you trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, you receive the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ gives you access into grace. And grace will result in, as you operate in the faith of Christ, then your faith is increased by knowledge. And so then the knowledge then, applied in grace, living in grace, will result in God's love coming through you. That's God's plan. But you see here in Luke eleven fifty two, what man does, what he does in verse 52 is the lawyers take away the key of knowledge. Why? Because there's no grace, there's legalism. And if there's legalism, there's no faith of Christ because it's all about what I do. If there's no faith of Christ, then I don't have the knowledge. And if I don't have the knowledge operating in me, then I'm not living uh, in grace and it doesn't result in God's love. So legalism takes away the key of knowledge and it takes away all this stuff. It takes away grace. Galatians 5, 1 through 4 says you're fallen from grace when you're under legalism. So it takes away grace. It takes away knowledge. It takes away God's love. And it replaces it with a system where you bite and devour one another and you seek the things of this world. So legalism results in uh, bite and devour. And that is from Galatians, because Galatians 5, 1 through 4 talks about falling from grace if you're under legalism. That's Galatians 5, 1 through 4. And then in verse uh, 15, it says, If you're under legalism, you bite and devour one another. Take heed, ye be not consumed one another. So you bite and devour one another under legalism. That's Galatians 5, 15. And that's also where Jesus is here. It's Luke 11, verses 53 and 54. So Jesus says in verse 52, Luke eleven fifty-two, 52, Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. You can't have the knowledge of God's word, because the knowledge of God's word comes by faith. Faith is separate from legalism. And so you've got to have the faith of Christ in you to be justified. You've got to have the faith of Christ in you to get the knowledge of God's Word. Then when you get the knowledge of God's Word in us and you live in grace, not legalism, the grace results in God's love being produced in you. So what the legalists do is they take away the key of knowledge. And so all of this over here as an ambassador for Christ is thrown out the window. But they got to replace it with something that looks good so that uh, you keep doing it. Because if I'm not going to get anything out of going to church and all this stuff, why do it? You know, I've heard uh, you go to these restaurants. Most waitresses hate working Sunday after church. You get the worst crowd on Sunday after church. They don't tip or they say, oh, well, my tip is a tract. And I see your tip. You know, I work here busting my and I'm just trying to make a living. I'm trying to support. I'm a single mom, and I got these two kids at home, and I'm trying to make a living, and I need these tips to survive because they don't pay me enough, and you give me a track. You know, that's what they're thinking. Where is God's love in that? Well, it's because I'm under legalism. I had to dress up. I had to smile and think, everything's okay. How you doing? All right, doing great. Yes, everything is fine. I love the Lord. Isn't he wonderful? And, you know, you got all these things. I had to get up. I could have been staying at home watching football. I had to go to this church. And then I got to listen. And I stand up and sing a song. And I sit down. And I stand up and sit down. Stand up and sit down. Then I got to hear this plea for money. Then I got to hear this guy talk. You know, it's just you, you got all this anger built up. It's like, I didn't want to be here, but I had to be here because of legalism. And then you get out of church and you take it out on the waitress. You're rude to them. You make a mess of the place. And then your tip is a tract. I, <laughs> You don't see this, Ambassador of Christ, in that. What you see is Galatians 5.15, you bite and devour. And so what does Jesus say here? In these three verses you learn. Verse 52, you lawyers, you took away the key of knowledge. So this is out the window due to your legalism. And instead, you're biting and devouring one another. So what do you hear in verse 53 and 54? The Pharisees began to urge vehem vehemently to provoke him to speak of many things. Well, we want you to keep talking because if you keep talking, you'll incriminate yourself under our laws because we're lawyers. 
and you'll incriminate yourself and then we can trap you and get you. You know, if, um, if I had a neighbor that was a lawyer, I would be real nice to that neighbor because the neighbor knows the laws and if they get mad at me, they could probably find some loophole in some law to change it around and sue me and take everything I have. Uh, so I would try to be, any lawyers in my life, I try to be super nice to them and just think that everything is great with them. I don't want to hurt them in the slightest because then they can use that law, knowledge of law, to entrap me and harm me greatly if that's what they wanted to do. So I don't want them to do that, so I'm going to be nice. But what does Jesus do? Well, unto you lawyers, you have taken away the key of knowledge, you enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, you hindered. Lawyers, ah, ah, I spent all this time, all these years learning this stuff. I got this high position. And this hot shot miracle working Jesus, and go take it away from me. Well, I'll show him. Yeah, yeah, keep talking, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, keep talking. What about this? What about that? That's why they tempted him with these questions. They didn't want to know. They want to trap him. Oh, Jesus, here's a... Uh, should we give things to God or give them to Caesar? Uh -huh. If he says God, well then we can get him for saying you can't, you shouldn't pay your taxes. And we'll turn him in. But if he says give it to the government, oh well then he's not a godly person like he says he was. He's not thinking of the things of God. We got him now. We got him now. And Jesus says, hand me a coin. Uh, whose picture's on this coin, Caesar? Well, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and render unto God the things which are God's. Oh, man, he got me again. I'm trying to bind and devour him, and I can't do it. Uh, that's why they're doing verse 54. Laying wait for him, seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Don't ever get a lawyer mad. But, of course, Jesus is perfect, so he gets away with it. And ultimately, uh, they do, the lawyers do have him crucified, on false charges and false witnesses. And that was what Jesus needed to do anyway. So, I mean, it was fine what Jesus did. It was perfect. But uh, for you, don't get lawyers mad. That's just a good rule of thumb. Um, uh, Luke 12. Uh, yeah, we're out of time, but we're going we're gonna to finish this. Uh, Luke 12, 13 through 15. Luke 12, 13 through 15. One of the companies sent unto him, Master... Speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. He said unto him, Man who made me a judge or a divider over you. He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So it shows you Jesus in the middle of these passages where he's trying to tell them 100% giving to receive the kingdom and all that we went over in the midst of these passages in Luke 11 and Luke 12 is coveting. Israel focused on the flesh. They don't care about the things of God. It's, uh, hey, my brother wouldn't give me my inheritance. You do something about this, Jesus. She say, I, what, you think I'm a judge in a court of law? Uh, I don't have the authority to do that. <laughs> you know? And then he says, beware of what this guy coveting. Who cares about that stuff? Let the other guy have that money. Yeah, sure, it's wrong, but hey, Mark of the Beast is coming. I did, they did it. Mark of the Beast is coming, and you're not going to have anything anyway. So who cares about that stuff? Trust in the things of God, not the things of this world. Uh, okay, we just got one more that I wanted to share, and then we'll be through Luke 12, 33. Uh, Luke 12, verse 16 through 21. Uh, this, again, goes along with this plan. It is a savings is not for Israel during the at-hand phase of the kingdom. He spake a parable, Luke 12, 16. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. Again, we've already understand the context of this. For Israel, he's saying uh, basically here, um, after Luke 12, is uh, don't save. 
Use the money that you have now because your soul is going to be required later on. But for us, 1 Timothy 5.8, I don't want to erase anything. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, take care of your household. And we talked about that last week. We talked about get a job. Take care of your household. Don't trust and don't sell all that you have and trust in God to provide you. We're told to take care of your household. If you don't, you've denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. It shows the contrast between the two programs. And so you see here, Jesus was anti-savings because the mark is coming soon. The kingdom is at hand. The mark is going to come. You're going to lose your savings anyway. So be rich in the things of God, not in the things of man. But today, you've got a mother-in-law who doesn't have anybody to take care of her. Well, you take care of her. Um, and if you don't, you're, you deny the faith and it's worse than an infidel. So um, it's showing you the difference in programs here. And as a right divider, you can understand that. Um, and so we're, we'll just stop there. We're over by about 10 minutes. So let's close. We'll start uh, next time in Luke 12, verse 45, the degrees of punishment in hell. And we'll go forward there. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us the Holy Ghost to help us understand these differences in the programs, how the at-hand phase of the kingdom is so much different than where we are today in grace. And so help us, Lord, with this understanding to be able to live in grace, to operate by the doctrine in Paul's epistles, and that when these supposed contradictions come up, that we know the answer by rightly dividing the word of truth. And help us, Lord, when the opportunities come up to give other Christians this knowledge too, so they also may come into the knowledge of the truth and have Christ living in them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.